Good evening and welcome to Poe Discussions with Jeannie and Carmen. Jeannie, you gonna say hi? Hi. <laughs> I'm actually visual today. So. Yes, yes you are with a, a very awesome background. Well, welcome back, and we have a very special guest this evening. We are so excited to welcome Mark DeWidziak. And Mark, if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I, I lay claim to no other title except writer. You know, I've been a writer, a professional writer for more than 45 years. Okay. Uh, for 43 of those years, I worked at newspapers, mostly as a uh, film, TV, and theater critic. So, um, you know, and, and I... Uh, stopped uh, my journalism career around uh, April of, of 2020. So uh, I've been exclusively writing books since then. My first book was published in 1982. And wow. um, so there have been about 25 books since then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I'm, I'm pretty much exclusively a, a book writer. And the books are all over the map. Um, mm -hmm. the resume is a deeply schizophrenic resume, which is, you know, <laughs> the first thing that I will cop to, which is people say, what kind of books do you write? And it always, I don't really know how to answer that because there's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's biography, mm -hmm. there's, there, I've written uh, a bit in the horror field, both fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Um, there are books about television. There, there is a film book. Uh, so it, there's a little bit of everything. I once was at a, a a book festival and I was at a table and they had a spread of my books and the guy went by the table and he nearly uh, dislocated his neck doing a double take as he went by because he's just like, I, and he was just, and I said, what's the matter? And he said, I don't get it. And I said, what's not to get? He said, well, what's the common theme here? Mm -hmm. And I said, me, I'm the common theme. I wrote all these, yeah. books. you know, these are all my interests. You know, they're books about Mark Twain. There's a book about Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, there's a book about Dracula. There's a book about uh, the Night Stalker series, uh, yeah. about Columbo. You know, so there's a little bit of, you know, it. it, it, it I, I don't know if there is a rhyme or reason to it. It's just that um, I don't yeah. like repeating myself. And I, you know, always like pursuing where the passions are. So, yeah. Uh, and there's like my bookcases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so basically, I'd like I said, uh, the, you know, the, the very shorthand is, uh, is I'm a writer and, you know, I've been lucky enough to have spent more than 45 years uh, being able to get paid for putting nouns and verbs together. You know, so that's that, all I looked for when I started. And uh, I've been very fortunate to uh, yeah. been able to do that. That's that's awesome. And I was going to say with the different genres and things that you you write, um, you've got a little bit in common with Poe because he wrote several different genres as well. So that's really a neat, neat thing. Yeah, yeah Poe was 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 deceptively versatile writer and uh, uh, both, both deceptively versatile and prolific. And yes. I don't he doesn't get enough credit for for both because um, a very small group of stories and poems have completely defined him. Uh, yes. And and that has, has kept us. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it is one of the reasons yeah. I wrote the book was because um, I, I didn't think, you know, sort of uh, people had an idea. Of, they, they they all have an idea who they think Poe was. Mm -hmm. And the idea is based on a, a, a stereotype. Yes. The stereotype is based on a caricature. You know, mm -hmm. so you basically have this this total misconception of who the actual Edgar Allan Poe was. And uh, and that includes, you know, as a writer is that um, when I was writing the book and uh, people learned that I was writing the book mm -hmm. uh, and they'd say, what are you working on? I'd say I was doing a work on a biography of Edgar Allan Poe. There was always the this somebody there. If, there was always one person who would get this almost beatific look on their face. And they'd look at me like, oh, Edgar Allan Poe. I love Edgar Allan Poe. And then they'd say, and I could, my lips would almost move with them on the next line. <laughs> and I'd never challenge it. But the next thing they said was, I've read everything he's written. And I, my mind would say, no, you haven't. No. <laughs> you haven't even scratched the surface. You have got one of those volumes that say the complete tales and poems of Edgar Allan Poe. And it, not even that is accurate or true. But right. you read that and you think you have read everything he's written. But then, I, you know, uh, as I always say in every talk I give about Poe to sort of drive home the misconceptions. That yeah. When they finally got around to, to doing Poe's collected 
works. And the first really good scholarly edition was done in the early 1900s. It was 17 volumes. The, he yeah. had written enough to fill, and that wasn't everything because we have discovered more since right, the, right. those 70 volumes were, were done. Mm-hmm. So for somebody who only lived to be 40 and mm-hmm. you know had wrote enough of such high quality to have filled 17 volumes, he was amazingly prolific. And yes. he, he was an amazingly dedicated artist. And um, I really think that's, a love, you, you can't sort of overestimate how much he probably inherited from his mother. Uh, yes. Eliza Poe was, a, was, was, she was a very versatile actress. Mm-hmm. She was versatile. She's very dedicated. He was very dedicated. And she mastered a, a staggering number of roles uh, mm-hmm. in, in, in her short lifetime. And she she had mastered uh, had committed to memory a staggering number because you had to if you wanted to work back then. Yeah. So you know by inheritance you see that artistic nature and that 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 bent towards being prolific. Uh, you see that coming directly from his mother. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and I was going to say since we are talking about your book, I wanted to to hold it up for everybody to see. And I, I just want to say that um, I loved your book. It, Thank you. You went into detail on so many things, especially like his parents. There was more information you put in your book that I've ever read in any of the other biographies or research I've done. I was telling Jeannie this and it just, all of the detail just impressed me so much. And I learned like, like Jeannie and I, no Poe, but we learned because she read it too. We learned so much more from your book. And I just, I appreciate that so much because I feel like we don't know everything about him. We know a lot, but we learned so much more, you know. Well, that's good to hear. You can't, you, you can't hear that too much, you know. Uh, oh, too no. often. Yeah. Um, I, I, I loved it. It was great. Yeah. The one certainly- thing that I enjoyed the most is you were putting into your book uh, particular researchers that I had already looked into and I'd already read. And as you know, anytime you do research, there is such a plethora of information that you have to go through in order to put together and make it coherent, basically, to where it fits. And then when you were bringing in things like from Dr. Hal Poe, because both Carmen and I have met him and went to one of his you know, things about Edgar Allan Poe and horror and all that kind of stuff. And then a few others that you brought into your book, I was like, this is great because for someone, me especially, I love doing research. It's my, it's my jam. And (laughs) I love it that I can find something that can have it all condensed into one. And it saves us a lot of time. Yes. <laughs> as you just said, you're never going to put everything that everything is about in one place because just for certain things there in history, there's always going to be things that you can't track down, things that were lost. Uh, you're just going by, you know, first person points of view and diaries and journals and So you're not going to get the whole picture because you're only going to see maybe one side. You're not going to get it all. But I did enjoy hearing about the little things, the things that nobody looks for about Poe. You know, um, Poe's life is, it's not a very well-documented life. There, 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 There are whole years where we have very little information about what he's doing or, you know, what his day-to-day life was like, you know, Mm -hmm. the early 1830s in Baltimore. We don't know if he's working, where he's working. There's just, you know, had he lived um, into the second part or was born like 10, 20 years later, it would probably have been a a much better documented life than it was. You you have these huge gaps. Uh, And, you know, one of the things that... you know, and I, and I always say this about uh, when when people are interested in the book or ask about the book, I always tr- try to explain and say, you know, this is not an academic uh, t- treatise on Poe. This is mm-hmm. not a, a, a scholarly work. This is uh, it does use scholarship and I hope it passes the test of what what scholars want. But I set out to write a popular biography of Poe. Mm-hmm. I, I, I set out to write a 
uh, a book that people would enjoy reading. Yes. And um, because that's the kind of writer Poe was. You know? mm -hmm. And, and I, I also knew uh, you, you, you can't fake it. You can't try to be a type of writer you're not. Now, right. you know, right. I've spent my lifetime, you know, as a uh, a, a popular writer, and I, I'm, I am not an actor. I, I have taught college classes as an adjunct, but I'm not, you know, I'm not really a professor. I just get to play one, you know, every once in a while. So, you know, I, I and, and I was a journalist, you know, for most of that time. Mm -hmm. So when a journalist does a story, what do they do? Well, they go out and they interview people. You go out and you, 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 you. So one of the things that I, I how I approached the book was, and I knew I was taking a chance. I, th you know, I, there were two major chances I took with the book, and I think you know, you that also fits Poe. Is one is that um, the timeline that there there are two timelines. Is that um, mm -hmm. you you have one timeline which follows Poe through the last four months of his life, and another timeline which charts his biography, looks back mm -hmm. alternating chapters until the two timelines to meet at the end and i knew that that was taking a chance but i also knew we didn't need another biography of poe that went a to z through his life we have a right. lot of them so we, mm -hmm. we have many of those so we didn't need another one like that so i that was one chance i took and the other chance was to do interviews and like well how, how do you do interviews with somebody who died in 1849 there's nobody right. alive who knew <laughs> Alan Poe. there's nobody alive who knew anybody who knew yeah. edgar Allan poe so, you know, I approached it as not only maybe a journalist or a documentarian would, but also as a detective on the case would. What do you do? You find witnesses. You find, well, in the case, my witnesses were people who have minutely studied little aspects of Poe's life and career. Uh, these professors, these academics who have spent, and it was also a way of giving them credit for what they have done. Mm -hmm. um, but I also went to, as you know, uh, forensic anthropologists, forensic pathologists, FBI mm -hmm. agents, uh, uh, detectives, um, uh, medical historians, and a group that I thought would give me particular insight into Poe was horror writers, you know, that I went yeah. to people like Stephen King and Anne Rice and asked them mm -hmm. you know, because you know i think that's one thing where we miss is like there's it takes a very particular psyche to be very good at this form of writing yes absolutely what does it take well who's going to know that where are you going to find the insight for that you're going to find it from the people who are the descendants of edgar Allan poe mm -hmm. it, you know, for at least for those that part of his career which he was very good at i mean i said at the top that those few stories have defined him with good reason. He was better at it than anybody else. He right. was fantastic <laughs> at it. And we're still, those stories still hold up. There's yes. still models of how to do it. So th th these were my witnesses, the, these people. These mm -hmm. were the people and put on the record. And then I used their voices throughout. And I knew that was taking a chance because you're not supposed to write a biography that way. You're supposed to spend all your time in dusty archives. And I did spend my spare time in, in with archives and museums and such. But mm -hmm. I wanted those alive voices because one of my arguments is that Edgar Allan Poe is more alive now yes. as a writer than he was in his lifetime. Absolutely. So I wanted very current, alive voices. And I knew that those two were taking a tremendous risk with the book. And, you know, books are always taking a chance. But with this one, I really felt like you're. I was going off the high diving board, not really knowing whether there was water in the pool or not. Right. You're know, going to find out when you get down there whether, you know, these chances have paid off or not. So, right. you know, when the book was done, I knew at, at least it was uh, a book in my, uh, an expression of, of who I am as a writer. You know, mm -hmm. because, again, you can't pretend to be a different kind of writer. So, yeah. you know, somebody says that, well, I don't like the book because it's not that, you know, say, fair, that's fair because, you know, I've, this, is, uh, this is the type of writer I am. And mm -hmm. it's very much a, a working writer's, biography of a working writer yeah mm -hmm. you know it's very much what this is and i, I am fascinated by the creative process you mm -hmm. know and, and and i never would like the answer of who the guy was who wrote those stories even if you wow. only know edgar Allan poe as the author of the telltale heart or the black cat or the raven or whatever it still does not tell you who that guy was who wrote those stories and why he was so good at it yeah, you still have to get behind the stereotype and the caricature to know who the actual artist was who was so good at writing those stories. 
Absolutely. So, well, that, 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 that's, that's kind of, you know, so, so, so I'm very grateful for what you're saying about, you know, because again, you, you, you never know until you, you, you do the book to your point of satisfaction and mm-hmm. you send it out into the world and you just, you hold your breath a little bit and go, is the world going to see what I see? You know? Yeah. Well, I did. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It, it because it was different than like you say, an A to Z from birth to death. And just and also kind of talking about the mystery behind his death. I've always been very fascinated with that. I know Jeannie as well. Jeannie's got a little bit of forensics background and or criminology, however you want to say it. And um, and so I, I just I loved reading, you know, that part of it. That you know, I I, I decided that when I yeah, I have to, you know, just as background for this. I have to tell you, this book was not my idea. Okay. You know, I have to cop to that. You know, I, you're going to find out very shortly if you have not discovered it already. I have no shortage of ego. Um, uh, that's never been a problem. Um, Nothing wrong with that. But I, 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 even I do not have the hubris to say, I am the person to write the next biography of Edgar Allan Poe. I'm the person mm-hmm. to do something somebody hasn't done before. I, I I just didn't now Edgar Allan Poe is a writer I've carried through my entire life mm-hmm. and even mm-hmm. at that and I've always been fascinated I have performed Poe uh for yes. 20 years with all of that I would never have su- suggested that this book mm-hmm. was a suggestion of an editor at St. Martin's oh, and, wow. okay. and it came out because um I had done a book on the Twilight Zone in 2017 yes. for St. Martin's and when a book does well enough um, there is in your contract what is called an option clause, which mm-hmm. you know, the option means you have to offer your next book to the publisher who who, who, who published this book. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean they're going to publish it, by the way. They don't have to publish it. The option is all their option. Okay. So you offer it them and then it they can either pass and you can go to another publisher, but you have to offer them your next book. Mm-hmm. So uh this, the Twilight Zone book had done well enough in hardcover and paperback to sort of have that discussion. And this was in the fall of 2019. Okay. And I was having this discussion with an editor at St. Martin's. And sometimes it takes somebody else to point out the obvious in your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody else who's got a little bit more perception than, than, uh, than, than you have on yourself, which is very hard to do for yourself. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we started the discussion and I gave him what I thought was my best uh, super slick can't miss idea. And the only problem was it missed. It missed badly. And he didn't like my idea at all. OK. So he countered with what he thought would be a good idea for me. And I didn't like his idea. Okay. And then I hit him with my second best idea. He didn't like that. He counted. <laughs> I didn't like that. And we were going back and forth like this. And yeah. Then- it kind of got to the point where we figured we're going to table this conversation for another day um, and we'll pick it up. It was it, This was not a contentious discussion at all. This was a very friendly, congenial discussion. But we were getting to the point of you don't like anything. Let's just revisit this. And we were just about to get off the phone. And he said, what about Edgar Allan Poe? And I said, what about him? And he said, well, it seems like it's been a, a while since there's been a, a major biography of Poe. Mm-hmm. And I said, it seems like there's been a couple fairly recently. And then I thought back, to oh, Jeffrey Myers, the Silver, those are in the 90s. Yeah. It's 20 something years ago. You know, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know so, so I said, OK, all right. But then it was like, what kind of book? Uh, and yeah. this is where, you know. He, but, but I, when I said, why did you say Edgar Allan Poe? He said, it seems like it checks a lot of your boxes. And I said, how do you figure that? Mm-hmm. And he said, well, you, Edgar Allan Poe is the father of the modern detective story. You have written a book about a, a landmark detective character with Columbo. Yes. Uh, Poe was the father of the modern horror story. You have written books about major horror topics like Dracula and the Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Poe was a critic most of his writing career. You were a critic most of your career. Mm-hmm. Poe was a major 19th century American author. You have written books about Mark Twain, a major 19th century American author. How does this not check all your boxes? And you know, and I thought, you know, you're right. And but then again, it came to what kind of book? 
And it very quickly became apparent he wanted. Well, there's this type of book that, that appears every couple of years and you're going to know it as soon as I say it. Okay. Every couple of years, it seems we get that book that purports to solve the mystery of who Jack the Ripper was. Yes, you know, I, I think we're up to about 15 definitive answers on who Jack the Ripper was. And, you know, there's going to be another one in a year or so. Yeah, that's going to say that we've we have solved it. And he wanted that kind of book that would solve the mystery of Poe's death. Okay. And I said at that point, uh, if that's the book you have your heart set on, if that's the book you really, really want, um, uh, there's one thing you absolutely need to do right now. And that is you need to go find yourself another lunatic because this one's driving away right now. <laughs> Let me tell you why that book cannot be written. Mm -hmm. A, no death certificate. B, yeah. no autopsy. And even if there had mm -hmm. been an autopsy, it would have been worthless because the state yes. of the autopsy at that point was extraordinarily primitive. Yeah. Few people knew how to do them, and they would have been conducting them with the equivalent of butcher's knives and machetes. Absolutely. No death certificate, no autopsy, no surviving soft tissue that can be you know, subjected to modern forensics. Mm -hmm. And Maybe worst of all, no reliable witnesses to Poe's death. Yeah. Uh, is that the, the, the witnesses to Poe's death not only contradict each other, they contradict yeah. themselves. And, Absolutely. And various, <laughs> uh, accounts they leave behind. It, you know, most notoriously, John Moran, the attending physician, mm -hmm. who leaves behind three accounts wildly different in tone and detail, going so far as to change Poe's last words going so far as to change the time of death. I mean, can you imagine what a modern attorney would do to John Moran if they had him on the stand, you know? Yeah. There would be nothing left but shredded underwear when they were through it. You know? Yes. So, <laughs> so I said, you know, so for all these reasons, this is a cold case and it's going to remain a cold case. I said, but yeah. hear me out. This is the book I will write. I'll write you a book that examines Poe's life because mm -hmm. I'm much more interested in how Poe lived than how he died. Yeah. I will, but I will use the mystery of his death as the filter through which we will examine his life. Mm -hmm. And he really liked that idea. And I said, and if I can come up with a theory, which I think is compelling, convincing, um, and logical, I will present it as such. I will not go so far as to say that I can prove it because that would yeah. be irresponsible. So, yeah. I said, yeah. you know, do I have a theory as to how Poe died? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do, do I make any claim that it, it, can, it can be proved? Absolutely not. You know, I'm not even sure I want if, if if I had a Pandora's box and I could open it and prove it. I'm not sure I'd open the box. Yeah. There, there's some there's there's something wonderfully romantic about the father of the American detective story, leaving us with a mystery that continues to baffle us. Absolutely. Of his death. Yes. I, I, I totally agree. So some death mysteries were not meant to be solved. I, I'm, um, I'm not so sure this isn't one of them. Yeah. So, but that's one of the, but it's the reason I kind of reversed the subtitle, you know, the, yeah. the main title of mystery of mysteries comes from the poem spirits of the dead, mm -hmm. which Sarah, Sarah and I perform spirits of the dead. And it's not one of his better known poems. And he wrote it when he was very young. He was still a teenager. Yeah, uh, he, he may, I mean, he may have just turned twenty when he when he wrote *Spirits of the Dead*. Yeah, he was it's a, it's fantastic. Yeah, I, it's I love a lovely that poem. One. And mm -hmm. Sarah loves it so much. She keeps saying, "You can have it read at my funeral. I want you to have it read at my funeral." I keep thinking, you know, well, why does she, she think, uh, you know, I'm going to outlive her anyway? Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we close every show that we do with Poe on Spirits of the Dead. And we oh, come nice. together and we alternate. And of course, the title comes from the last stanza, which, you know, is the breeze, the breath of God is still and the mist upon the hill, shadowy, shadowy, yet unbroken is a symbol and a token how it hangs upon the trees, a mystery of mysteries. And that's the title of the book. Yes. But the subtitle is reversed. It's the death and life of Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. And it's reversed for a lot of reasons. The one reason is because with most people, when you discuss their life, you start at the logical point 
which mm-hmm. is when somebody is born. That's when you always start, you know, it's a logical start. Well, with Poe, every discussion of his life always seems to start with his death. It yeah. always seems like we start there. It's like, you know, it's true. first thing that comes up. And so that's one reason it's reversed. The second reason it was reversed is that um, Poe gets buried a lot in his lifetime and his afterlife, mm-hmm. you know, He's 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 literally we, we know, you know, one of the things we we know for certain sure is that he stops drawing breath on October 7th, 1849. We know that. Mm-hmm. And then we know for certain that he's buried the next day in a small Presbyterian cemetery in Baltimore on a cold, windy, miserable, overcast day in a service mm-hmm. attended by very few people. Yes. And then we know the next day he's buried again when Rufus Griswold publishes his infamous obituary. (laughs) He's buried under a mountain of misinformation and lies and malicious slander. And, you know, Griswold does damage to Poe that has not been undone to this very day. Absolutely. So then, you know, and then we they dug him up in 1875 to mm-hmm. put him in the better part of the the, the put the monument in at the, the better part of the cemetery, and they buried him again. I mean, this guy just keeps getting buried, you know. And then oh, here comes the 20th century, and we bury him under all of the the caricature, and we make him the grandfather of goth and all of that. And but you know, everybody who's ever read Edgar Allan Poe knows there's one hard and fast rule, and that's nothing stays buried in an Edgar Allan Poe story. <laughs> so, uh, and he ain't gonna stay buried. No, he's gonna come zooming out of the grave triumphant, and he is going to outlast, outlive, and outshine all the people who are supposed to outlast him. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason I reversed the subtitle is because Edgar Allan Poe has the best afterlife of any writer. Yes, uh, he is the best read American writer, not only in his own country, but around the world. And it's not even close. There's not even yeah. a good, good, good second. And he gets reintroduced in curriculum. Mm-hmm. God bless the public school system. He gets reintroduced by the pop culture and the public school system. It's a great one two punch. Absolutely. So everybody gets that Allen and Poe. And, yeah, uh, they do. Oh. And I, I I get to teach Poe um, in the spring semester. I teach freshman English and in pub, public school and um, the kids love it. And especially since this new um, series on Netflix, The Fall of the House of Usher has come out. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my students from last year have, you know, that know how much I really like Poe. My students this year know I like Poe, but they don't know how much yet. And my students from last year keep running. Have you watched it? Have you watched all of it yet? Tell me what you think. And so it's it's exciting to see their excitement for Poe because they that's really kind of helped them as well. And I, and I can't tell you how many times teachers have told me this. Yeah. Told them, you know, we love teaching Poe and the students love getting Poe. And what a great yeah. age to get Poe. It, I mean, absolutely. You know, seventh grade, you know, and and, and you, you get Poe seventh, eighth, ninth, right through high school, then into yeah. the college if you take a, you know, a overview of, of English courses, any kind. You're going to you're gonna just keep getting Poe. But that first one, seventh grade, it's just, I mean, because for most kids in the seventh grade, reading is just a bloody chore. Most kids do not yes. like to read. I mean, there's always the the, the exceptions. Yeah. But, um, most kids at that age, they don't like reading and, and they hate reading assignments. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden we give them Edgar Allan Poe and Edgar Allan Poe is, you know, dismembering corpses and locking people up in torture chambers and walling them up in catacombs. And all of a sudden this the reading's a bloody joy. It's not a bloody chore anymore, yeah. but also a tremendous jolt to the imagination. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a, it's a great age to, to get something which is, Oh, this is reading. This is fun. This is great. Exactly. So, which is, you know, my father got Poe. In in the and de- during the depression, pre World War II, my father got Poe in the public school system. That's you know? awesome, and he loved Poe. And I mean, can, can you imagine we giving these same stories to kids by a contemporary author? If we were giving these same stories, and they were by a contemporary author, and the parents found out you're giving them stories where people are murdering and dismembering corpses. You're giving them this. There would be an outcry from one end of the country to the other. Mm-hmm. And nobody says anything. 
Absolutely. About life. Yeah. And that's because they got it. The, that's because the parents and the grandparents got it and they already love Poe. Oh, they're getting Poe? Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, 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 it's, one, it, 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 it's, it's one of the great things about Poe. Poe is our renewable literary energy source. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. You know, and I, 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 that, that's one of the reasons why, you know, and people not only recognize Poe, they get an image of Poe. They get you, you say Edgar Allan Poe. Well, we put Poe on posters like the one behind you. We put him on t shirts. Mm -hmm. We put him on t tins. We put him on ties. We put him on buttons. We put him on plushies. We've got Poe action figures. I mean, you know, you go into a, a bookstore and there'll be shelves of merchandise devoted to Poe. Yes. Where are the shelves for Melville? Where are the shelves for Emerson? You know, well, they don't <laughs> exist, you know. Um, and and Poe, we market him, we you know we commercialize him, we market him, so people get this. They, they, when when you say the name Edgar Allan Poe, they not only get an image of of Poe as of what he looked like, they also immediately know of the Telltale Heart or the. You don't have to explain those things. I've I've spent the year giving talks in several states on Poe. Mm -hmm. And after every talk, somebody comes up to me and says, you know, when I was in school, I had to memorize the first four stanzas of the Raven. And then they do it. And then they do it. And I always let them and I'm always delighted. And they know it. And they don't miss a word. You know, once upon yeah. a bit, weary while I pondered, weak and weary, go, go, go. And it's, <laughs> and it's just like, who could do that for any other American author? I mean, can you imagine coming up to somebody coming up to you and saying, you know, uh, I, 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 I had to memorize the, the first four paragraphs of this Washington Irving story or, you know, oh. or, or this Herman Melville uh, or this Longfellow poem. You know, and so so there's a connection to Poe that does not exist with any other writer. And I'd say any other writer. I'm not even saying American writer, any other writer. It's a connection that does not even exist with Shakespeare. That's true. That's true. Because I, I will say most kids, especially nowadays, they don't like Shakespeare as much just because even though Poe's prose was very wordy, very, but the descriptions are so heavy and just open, like you said, opens up your imagination. They connect with him much more than Shakespeare because they feel like they're reading a foreign language sometimes. And so um, I know because like we do Romeo and Juliet the same time we we actually do Annabelle Lee because we it's a star crossed lovers unit. And they're like, can we get through Romeo and Juliet so we can get to Poe? And I'm like, just hold on. We're going to get there. <laughs> so, so, yeah, absolutely. I'm Like I said, and and, and my interest in Poe actually precedes the seventh uh, seventh grade. You well, know, yeah, was, we were going to ask, when was your first introduction to Poe? I um, became a horror fan at the age of seven. Um, oh, wow. I, was, I was, grew up in New York, and there was a station in New York, dear old WPIX Channel 11. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, see, they, and I don't want this to sound like the night the old nostalgia burned down, but uh, <laughs> when I was... You know, when I was growing up in New York, we're talking about the the early 60s, you know. Okay. So um, there's no Nickelodeon. There's no Disney Channel. There's no, you right. know, entertainment, which is designed specifically for children. Right. So what they gave us when I was growing up was they gave us the entertainment of our parents and in some cases our grandparents. Mm -hmm. So the very first children's entertainment I remember on local television was Laurel and Hardy. Mm -hmm. And the Three Stooges mm -hmm. and Abbott and Costello. And yeah. so we got comedy teams and we we that we, we got a steady diet of it. Yeah. So by the age of seven, I that was kind of the primary influence for me. That was my first kind of uh introduction into the pop culture. Mm -hmm. And when I was seven years old, uh, Channel Eleven showed a movie called Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Okay, yes. Well, I was there for the Abbott and Costello half of the title. I didn't know what a Frankenstein was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the middle of that film is, you know, playing Dracula for only the second time uh, and magnificently is Bela Lugosi as, mm -hmm. as, as, mm -hmm. in the cape. And that performance and that film turned me into a horror fan. I was so 
just fascinated by uh, by the imaginative process of all of this yeah. that I immediately started to seek out any other you know horror stuff that was stuff I was watching you know the, the Outer Limits and the Twilight Zone I was wow. uh, waiting for the next Hammer horror film to come out in the movie theater I was watching Dark Shadows when it came along in 1966. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I was, was scouring the TV listings every, cause for an old universal film or a 1950s film, of uh, science fiction, uh, horror film. And when you start to do that, you know, you very quickly become aware that there was this guy, Edgar Allan Poe, who mm -hmm. had an enormous influence on all this stuff that you're, so I knew the name Poe before the seventh grade because of this. Okay. So somewhere between, you know, like the second grade and the seventh grade. Um, I, and you all re you both remember uh, the Scholastic catalog that they would bring yes. around to your oh, class. Yes. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> right. Well, so did I. So did I. So you scour the, the for for your, your most likely and uh, the Scholastic catalog. Uh, and and I don't know. This must, probably was about the fifth or sixth grade, but they had um, ten. Great Mysteries by Edgar mm -hmm. Allan Poe. This is the nice. actual book I ordered. This was how I remember my, that book. This was this was uh, uh, the the start of uh, you know on which my entire Poe library was built. That this, is awesome. You still have that. So this was that, and then they also did one called uh, Eight Tales of Terror. It was uh, the Scholastic. Nice. So these two, you know, these eighteen tales, um, and it included uh, the Black Cat and uh the telltale heart and the cask of amontillado and the fall the house of usher and the purloined letter so mm -hmm. i had a pretty good introduction to poe before the seventh grade absolutely that's yeah. that's really cool well my um we're talking about when we first got introductions my introduction to things happened through and this is going to sound really strange but radio classics because my family was not, we, we didn't have a TV for the longest time. And it was radio classes, like the War of the Worlds with, uh, you know, Orson Welles. And then, then it moved up to Paul Harvey. And not a lot of people remember Paul Harvey. But Paul Harvey was great because I still remember his voice and the stories that he would tell. Mm -hmm. My first favorite black and white horror film was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in the 1930s. And that's the first, that was the first horror film I remember watching was that one. But moving throughout my wild, I'm like you, I have so much eclectic things. I go from, you know, my scholastics cover all the ghost stories, all supernatural that you could find up until you know you go into criminology i got the hardy boys hardy boys were my jam okay because i loved all the hardy boys but the one thing that really i love the most about poe and especially it still being in the school room is that it, it just gives kids the chance to have that curiosity children yeah. have lost their curiosity and have lost imagination because they were being given everything. It's like, it's so instant gratification. They can find it on the internet. They see everything. But with Poe, Poe, you have to, and we've discussed this in our Poe and Plug so many times, he builds the story, but he leaves it to the reader how they feel about the story or how they feel about the characters. Just like the behind me, the cask of Amontillado. You know, in that story, you don't know which one you actually want to root for. Which one's going to get justice? Is there justice? You know, that's the one thing about Poe. Poe has that storytelling down to a science. And it's so great that he's still alive today. And in my opinion, he's getting more now after he's dead. Than he got while he's alive. No question. No yeah. question about it. You know, and, and I, I love what you just said, because uh, I taught a writing class at Kent State for 10 years uh, and I would teach it each semester. And at the end of the, the, the class, I would talk to them and uh, about, um, you know, and I say, you know, everybody wants to tell you what's wrong with you. You know, mm -hmm. you, you are the millennials and everybody has this idea of what's wrong with the millennials. 
you know, the first thing they're going to start with is that you're lazy, you know, or you're stupid. And I said, you know, I've gotten to know all of you and I get to know, you know, a new group of you every few months Mm -hmm. and you're not stupid and you're not lazy. You know, they don't know you, you know, they, they, and, and whenever anybody takes a ruler out and makes a blanket statement like that you know you're dealing with a closed mind you know you're dealing Mm -hmm. with anybody who does that to any group of people you're dealing with with a closed mind i said but i tell you what you're not and i said if i could give you one thing if i could magically give you one thing it would not be wisdom it would not be opportunity it would not be happiness none of those Mm -hmm. things would i give you i would give you one thing curiosity you are not curious and I said, and it's not your fault. It's been drummed out of you because we've given you these things since you're now, since you're, you're, you know, for, we're able to, 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 to walk, you get these things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I said, and I, 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 I said, nothing happens without curiosity. Yeah. All the other things happen because it starts with you being curious. And if you're not curious, you don't go anywhere. you you stay in one place. If you're not curious. And I said, and that's the one thing I would give you. And I would give them examples of this. I'd say, you know, for instance, I showed you uh, a film called Nosferatu. For most of you, it was your first silent movie, your first foreign movie, Mm -hmm. and your first black and white movie. Mm -hmm. A lot of you didn't like it. You were bored by it. You were perplexed by it. But at least half of you thought that was cool. That was really cool. And that's great. That's wonderful. I said, but you know, in 10 years of teaching, not one student has ever come up to me after I've shown Nosferatu and said, are there any other movies like that? Could you recommend something else like that? And that is true of act. I mean, if I had seen a movie with an actor or, or by a director at that age, my first question would have been, what else did this guy do? Yes, yes. What guy, what else did, you know? And I think that's one thing that is very much lacking and I think, and again, and a lot of it isn't their fault because the yeah. culture has, you know, we were encouraged in our youth because with fewer channels, we sampled a lot more. Yes. Yep. And we had this thing that, you know, now people look at this as kind of banal, but it wasn't. We had these things called variety shows. And yes. even something like the Ed Sullivan show, within an hour, you might get opera, country music, ballet jazz rhythm and blues tap dancing old vaudeville new comedy rock mm-hmm. music mm-hmm. you got a chance to sample all of this people's culture how many of you became jazz aficionados because of the ed sullivan show because they oh, saw awesome. for the very first time you know a a, a a jazz great on the uh, on the ed sullivan show or one of these other now everybody goes to their own corner of the pop yeah. culture and yeah. we don't share anything anymore that's true. We have more channels and more choices and people get less exposure to the wide variety of what is cultures. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things which which I, I, I agree with completely when you're when you're talking about curiosity is that one is a word I use a lot, you know, and when I talk to it to to writers groups, I you know, I, I say, you know, nothing happens without curiosity. Never mind what you don't get to wisdom without curiosity. You don't get to imagination without curiosity. That but is it's got to start there. It has got to start yeah. there. And it's just amazing like, you have to do that. That's true. Yeah. yeah. When I used to teach uh, writing, when I taught English, I had to retire. But when I used to teach English, I, before they brought me their stories, I would make them just write a story, not give them any parameters. I would just say, write me a story. And I said, if you bring me that story and I have to ask why, or I have to keep saying why, then you haven't told me the whole thing. You haven't given me a story because I need to know why. And that is the question that these kids don't ask anymore about anything. Everybody Mm -hmm. accepts everything now, whatever you're told, nobody just wants to ask question why. And like you were saying, when you were, you know, watching Nasratu, wow. You know, why? Why why was this so phenomenal? Where can I find more of this? Why did I like it so much? Why do I want to watch something like this? You know, and like you said, the variety shows. I got interested in jazz, you know, Ella Fitzgerald. 
you know, all those wonderful, you know, um, Billie Holiday, she was one of my favorites. And it was always like, why was it so drawing to me? Why was I so drawn to it? And a lot of it was, I was never introduced to that when I was younger because it was not in my, my little world. Now yeah. there's no such thing as a small world. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you said, with this right here, these telephones in our hands, they think they have everything there is in the world. And so they don't need to search out and find things. They don't need to look for things. And Poe, you know, he's still alive and well, because I think he is the reason that people are just like, well, wait a minute. Why? Why do I still want to watch, you know, read Poe? Why is he so interesting? And, you know, you, you know, another thing, it, you, you, uh, a point which I make a lot, something you were talking about, is that Poe's short stories are like uh, models of how to write mm -hmm. a short story. I mean, first yes. off, Poe writes with all his senses. Mm -hmm. you, know, when, when, you know, you take something like the Telltale Heart. He uses all the senses, so he makes you hear the sounds, the littlest bit of sound, yes, the, the, yes. the withdrawing of the latch and the littlest sound that it makes. Light and how he plays with light and this the gradations of light and the, mm -hmm. the pale blue eye. And he puts you in that room and he makes you feel all of the things that are in there. And for all of that that he does... Poe only tells you so much. Poe didn't write for the theater. I mean, he, he tried to one, write one play and it was he never finished it and it was a failure. Yeah. Uh, yes. but, but most writers of that era did not write for the theater. They did not think the theater was a outlet for literature. It's not until the end of the century that people like Ibsen mm -hmm. and Shaw start to uh, make people think again, oh, this could be literature. Yeah. So, but, but you could tell Poe inherited from, again, from his parents Mm -hmm. he, he right those are perfect monologues the telltale heart no wonder every actor loves to perform the telltale heart yeah. they're perfect he tells you only so much and not a, like mm -hmm. who's he telling the story to but is it even a he there's yeah. not one thing about the telltale heart that is gender specific absolutely and i've said made the point people say oh no it's a man I said, go back and read the story <laughs> there's not one thing that that trips you you're just assuming you're just assuming this is so, you know, who is the per, who's the narrator talking? Is, is this the keeper of the asylum? Is the police officer? Who is this? Who is he talking? Is it a doctor? Mm -hmm. Same thing with the with the cask of Amontillado. Who, who's Montrestor telling the story to his confessor at oh. the end of his life? Is this, you know, uh, you know, confess your sins on your deathbed and you get a free trip to heaven? Is this what this is? <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people when they read Poe, especially like with the Telltale Heart, a lot of people place Poe as that narrator, and I don't think Poe wrote every story as himself as the narrator. Well, that is, you see, uh, the blowback to Griswold comes, you know, from some of Poe's friends. Uh, and Poe was not friendless, and he did have a lot of friends who did right. write in his defense. But mm -hmm. the primary defense from Poe in the in the eighteen hundreds comes from dun, 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 the French, led by Baudelaire, and. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the, they do as much damage to Poe as Griswold did, because yeah. even though they adored Poe, mm -hmm. it, it 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 kind of thrilled them to think that Poe's genius came from a touch of madness. Yeah. And so they were the first to sort of encourage the idea of confusing Poe with his unreliable narrator. Well, Poe yes. is the one talking to the bird and the raven. Poe is the one contemplating revenge in the cask of Amontillado. Poe is the one who is driven mad by his obsession with the pale blue eye and the telltale mm -hmm. heart. And this became uh, such a strong uh, way of viewing Poe that the illustrators of Poe's stories in the late 80s actually start to draw the characters to look like Poe. Yes. You start to see this <laughs> going into the, the stories. And then, you know, you get into the 20th century and this becomes part of how Poe is taught. It, when I was in, in high school in the early 70s and we got Poe in, in high school, the teachers basically encouraged that view of Poe was that, you know, he this was him. Uh, doing all these things and that undercuts his genius as yeah. a writer yes. that that does is poe was not brilliant at this because he was mad he was brilliant at this because he was in total control of his art yes and the more yes. you study 
how he wrote and how he constantly revised and how he looked for every perfect word and later scratched it out in a later version of it. And, you know, he was always improving it and he was always working it. This is a master craftsman. Yes. Who is, who is, yes. You know, so it, it, it Poe is a genius. Yes. But he wasn't a genius because he was mad. He was a, a genius because he could depict madness. And he yes. could not depict that unless he was in total control of that. So mm -hmm. it's one of the things that uh, that drives me up the wall. I know a lot of post scholars get vexed about this yeah. because uh, you know this is one of the things which has led to our misunderstanding of Poe. Um, we have embraced not only Griswold's caricature of him, but we've embraced Baudelaire's uh, mm -hmm. caricature of him, and 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 That's neither funny. is true. Neither is is anywhere near true. Well, I know when um, my husband and I travel some and, you know, if it comes out in conversation meeting, you know, people <clears throat> in places and um, I tell them about the podcast, um, the one of the first things they say is, well, Poe was on drugs, you know, and drunk all the time when he wrote. And it's like, no. Have you ever tried to write anything if you even have had one drink? you know, and trying to be creative. Well, no. And I'm like, you can't, I mean, you, yes, you can write some things, but he, that was not him. That. And it's one of the things that is documented about is like, we know there are these long periods of sobriety where we went 12, 14 months without ever touching yeah. anything and where he was absolutely dedicated to his, 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 his work, his profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and again, alcohol, is it a problem for Poe? Yes, but it's not the problem that everybody thinks it is. Right. Exactly. One drink had a devastating effect on Poe and it had mm -hmm. a devastating effect on his system. And it took days for him to recover. Absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't just a simple morning hangover for Mr. Poe. Exactly. He, uh, you know, it took him a long time to recover. So, you know, he's, he's allergic to alcohol, mm -hmm. you know. He, he, and he Poe's problem is he always takes the wrong time to drink. Yes. If there's a bad time to take a drink, that's when Poe's gonna drink. It's yes. like it, it, it's like if there's a, the, the imp of the perverse, you know. That's what the, Poe has the imp of the perverse. If there's the wrong time to pick a fight, you know. It, I mean, the point where you're almost incredulous, you know, you when you're reading a, a biography of Poe, you're thinking, you really, really, you thought <laughs> this was the right time to pick a fight. Oh, <laughs> this is the right man. thing. This guy's trying to help you. Exactly. You know? <laughs> He's constantly pulling the rug out from under himself. Oh. Um, you know, so yeah. yeah, you know, but but again, as you said, common sense tells you that mm -hmm. nobody can only live to be 40, li leave more than 17 volumes of work done at such a high level of writing yes. and been mm -hmm. under the influence of alcohol the whole time. Common yeah. sense tells you that's impossible. You know? Exactly. Oh, I know. I know. And and well, again, there's no evidence. Even his worst enemy, Thomas Dunn English, didn't uh, said there's no truth that that Poe took drugs. You know, oh, I mean, yeah. the only drugs Poe took were were the ones which were prescribed by doctors. Exactly. Know? Oh, and, I know. So you know the, the whole idea that he was a drug addict, the whole idea that he, you know. You know, it's just like uh, I, I can't remember which uh, curator, which post site, whether it was in Baltimore or, or Philadelphia or Richmond. But one of them said that somebody showed up and said uh, on the take a tour and said, you know, well, the only thing I know about Poe is that he died drunk in the gutter. And he's like, no part of that statement's true. You don't know anything about Edgar <laughs> Allan Poe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, you know, my goodness. So, so that's uh, how 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 persistent the, the caricature is. That is yes. how, how incredibly persistent the caricature is. A absolutely. And, and, one, and of the, one of the things that drove me nuts, one of the things that in interviewing all those those horror writers and actors and directors and all these leading practitioners of horror, one of the things that struck me in interviewing all of them was what great senses of humor they had. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them were richly funny people. And if you yeah. notice, fans of horror tend to be very funny people. Yes. You, know, you want to hear laughter, go to a horror convention. You're, you know, yes. you can be surrounded <laughs> by laughter. And, oh. you know, and, and, and when I mentioned this to Stephen King, you know, he said, well, of course, you know, a sense of humor is an essential part of, you know, your DNA if you're a horror writer, because if without it, you'd go crazy if you're writing. Absolutely. This is what keeps you sane. This is what keeps you grounded. And humor and horror flip sides of the same coin. Yes. There's two metaphoric devices we used 
to approach and analyze difficult subjects, subjects we don't like to think about. Absolutely. They're very big subjects or painful subjects. And um, I mean, they're twins, humor and R. Yeah. And they even look like twins. They're, you know, two, two syllable words starting in H ending in R. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, it, and, and it struck me that if all of them had this great sense of humor, it was so essential to them, then Poe must have had a sense of humor. It's like the last thing we grant him. And yet the more you discover about Poe, the more you realize he had a wonderful sense of humor. He was very mm-hmm. funny. He wrote as much humor as he did horror. We just don't read yes. the humor anymore, but he loved writing the, the 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 satires and the hoaxes and the humorous sketches. But if you're looking carefully, you'll see he's very funny in certainly in the criticism, he's it, it, which is where he what he was best known for in his lifetime. Yeah. He's very funny in, in the reviews, but he's very funny in the horror stories if you're paying attention. Yes, he is. Absolutely. Because, you know, particularly the cask of Amontillado. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got that whole thing of, you know, Montresor saying, no, we must go back. Your health is precious. You're a man to be missed uh, to me. And, <laughs> you know, and finally, you know, Fortunato has that coughing fit and he can't even talk for a while. And Montresor says, enough, we must go back, you know, and says, enough. It is a mere nothing. I shall not die of a cough. <laughs> that's the truth. And if that's not enough of a laugh line, Poe then has Montresor say, true. Yeah. Exactly. And he's letting you in on the joke. He's exactly. Poe knows what he's doing. No, Poe knows exactly what he's doing. When yes. Sarah yeah. performed the cask of Amontillado, and we get, and she does the voice of Fortunato, and I, okay. and I do Montresor. Mm-hmm. So, and we get to that line. I hit that line true, and the people fall out of their chairs. You know, I love that. <laughs> so Poe knew what he was doing. You know, you know. So he's very funny, even in the horror stories. He's very funny. I mean, to this day, we don't really know whether the system of Doctor uh, Feather, Professor, and Professor Tar. We don't really know whether that story was written as satire. Mm-hmm. Or to be somewhat of a real horror story, this the, the, the you know the same thing mm-hmm. um, is true of a couple of the horror stories, which we de- we can now look at. Is was he be like 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 uh, the case of Monsieur Valdemar? Yes, you know, it's so much over the top. It could be satire. I, you know? I agree. Yeah, you know? and and it, it 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 ends. I mean, it has probably the the the, the biggest gross out uh, moment of any post story in mm-hmm. it and it's so over the top that you wonder is is he satirizing like the the, the run of the mill horror stories that appeared in a lot of the magazines right yeah. yeah i mean you see that story put into both horror and humor collections of poe yeah and, i mean we're still not sure about that one yeah, yeah. It, it it's i know it, his I, like we just read um never bet the devil your head in poe unplugged um what genie Two months ago, months. yeah, two, yeah, October. Months. It was, I think, October. Yeah, yeah. and um, everybody loved the satire from that. That one's just classic, you know, with how Poe wrote it. And it's yeah. still one of his best. I mean, yes, it's, it's yes. still one of his most effective, best uh, humorous pieces that, mm-hmm. that does hold up very well. Absolutely. But- but 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 again, he you know but but Poe you know he was personally funny. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was mm-hmm. very, you know, he, he was known for being you know he was a, raised to be a Southern gentleman. He had a he had a mm-hmm. very, very lively wit, and yeah. uh, you mm-hmm. know so these are things we deny Poe. Yes, know, of the, we make of him the relentlessly gloomy, melancholy, you know, guy drawn to the death culture and all of that. And, you know, and is there an element of truth to that? Well, yes, of course, there's an element of truth. To that. Did he play yeah. up to it? Yeah, he did that, too. Mm-hmm. You know, we know that, you know, he loved to dress it. And when he gets a certain amount of fame from the Raven, we know he's playing up to it. We know, Absolutely. You know, he was playing Poe. <laughs> what is that lovely story of him, you know, going for a walk in the neighborhood kids in New York, following yes. him, throwing pebbles at his at his heel and sneaking <laughs> up and getting as close as they dare. And he would wait until they got just close enough. And then he'd wheel around and shout, never more. And they'd go screaming off into the night. <laughs> but he loved it. They loved that, it. He loved it. You that know? would have been amazing to see. <laughs> oh, my I, goodness. I, so, I mean, you know, you're, you're dealing with, with, with somebody who, you know, I, I don't want to make, you know, because, again, I think Poe would have been a tremendously difficult friend. Um, I think, you know, I think Poe would have been the very definition of high maintenance. Um, yes. You know, there, there, there's, a, 
there was one, you know, post scholar who, who said it's in the book has said like, you know, if you were sitting home alone on Sunday having dinner and there was a knock on the door and you had a little peephole in the door and you could look through and you saw it was Poe, you might pretend you were you weren't home, you know. You just know it wasn't going to be a happy story, you know. I, uh, mm-hmm. I, I a couple of months ago I was doing a Poe talk and during the question and answer period somebody asked me if you could have dinner with either Mark Twain or Edgar Allan Poe, which would you choose? And I, I, I mean, I didn't even have to think about it. I, I said, oh, Mark Twain in a heartbeat. You know, we're going to have a good time. You know, we're going to smoke a couple cigars. We're going to have some scotch. We're going to tell funny stories. We're going to have a good time. Poe's going to be, you know, uh, Poe's high maintenance. He's, de- he's definitely, yeah. now, having said all that, I would have loved to have been Poe's friend. Yeah. I would have loved yeah. to have been able to go back and say to Poe, don't worry you're the one you're the one they're going to remember you're the one they're going to they're they're still going to be reading you know and Mm -hmm. and i said that to one of the post scholars and said you know you you wish he knew yes he said i think he did and i thought about it and i said you know what i think you're right i Mm -hmm. think he did because poe knew he was a genius yeah and that has really got to make you lonely to be the only one who kind yeah. of sees, you know, because the the, the 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 19th century isn't very good to Poe because one of the reasons that his contemporaries could not see how good he was was because we were into uplift. Uh, I mean, yeah. the whole idea of literature was that there had to be a moral. There had to be an obvious moral. And this leads to the Chautauqua mm-hmm. book. And Poe does the Chautauqua movement isn't very kind to Poe because they they don't yeah. embrace Poe. They do like people like Longfellow and the poets of the mm-hmm. heart who, who give you the obvious moral and the American fortitude and it's it's all this. It's really the twentieth century. We had to catch up to Poe. Yeah, in the twentieth century, Poe comes into his own because yeah. the twentieth century he gives you the horrors of the First World War. In the Depression and the Second World War and the atomic bomb and the Holocaust, yeah, and the arms race, and all of a sudden Poe kind of brings on a resonance because he's telling mm-hmm. us things about ourselves that maybe we don't want to hear. Yeah, and he really becomes the 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 writer of the 20th century. He's a much more modern for all the archaic language that he uses sometimes. Thematically, he's very modern. And I think that is one of the reasons we're still reading him and we're still because it, while the other writers have faded and their their fashions have faded and sort of naivete have faded. Yeah. Now has a resonance he didn't have in his own lifetime. That's and, very true. Um, and yet he knew. And yet, you know, I mean, I, one of my favorite posters that's in the book that um, after he finished The, the Raven in uh, 1845, mm-hmm. it had not been published yet. He goes for a walk. He's living in uh, Manhattan and he goes for a walk and he encounters a young friend from Kentucky uh, named Wallace, uh, who is a poet, who's also a poet. Mm -hmm. They hail each other in the street and Wallace says, Poe, how are you doing? And Poe says, all right, I'm doing great. I have just completed the greatest poem ever written. And what do you say to that? I mean, how do you respond to that? (laughs) Oh, so Wallace sort of said, well, well that, that's that's good, you know, that's good. And, and Poe said, no, no, you don't understand. I have just completed the greatest poem ever written. And then he recites it for him. This is the mm-hmm. first public performance of The Raven on uh, uh, the streets of New York to an audience of one. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he completes it. And 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 and, and what, what, is, what, what do you say? You know, Wallace says like... Oh, that is fine and poe roars fine fine that's all you can say fine this is the greatest (laughs) poem ever written he knew yeah he knew what he had done now writers are basket cases we get done with something and the first thing we do is we second guess ourselves i mean i think every writer you know when they say i'm going to become a writer they're 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 issued a favorite coffee mug uh, a copy of the elements of style by strunk and white and a raging case of imposter syndrome you know is everybody you finish something and you go oh i I don't know should i have done this should i've done that poe completes the rave and he knows what he's done well that's mozart yeah that's a level of, of, of so 
there was Poe lonely in the sense that he is probably the only one who sensed his own brilliance, you, you know, yes. at a time when the world is lauding Longfellow and the, 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 the New England writers. Mm hmm. That's, I mean, and, 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 and not only is that, is he's not being recompensed for any of this. He's not being fairly. Yeah. For his labor. He's, there are no copyright laws. So he gets pays a few dollars for a, a short story as brilliant as the purloined letter or, or a oh, poem yeah. as brilliant as the raven and then it gets reprinted free in every other publication up and down the coast mm -hmm. so yeah it just oh it just it, it makes you sick that mm -hmm. you know that he had to go through that yep so i mean you know he, he is um uh, he, he the, the, everything he gets now he deserves and more than yes. deserves it's, 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 absolutely it's, and like i he said he was ahead of his time yeah, way ahead of his time. I said yes. we had to catch up. You know, we had to catch up to Poe, and, yeah. and it took it took the twentieth century, I think, for us to really, really understand that. You know, I mean, there there's a there was a whole academic bias against, but there still is somewhat, of, mm -hmm. especially with the yeah. poetry, um, which still exists. I think that you know, uh, and and then this goes by T. S. Eliot said some pretty awful things about Poe. Yeah, and that has yeah. has remained. Uh, in the academic bias against him, but uh, my opinion, he didn't have any room to talk because T.S. Eliot is still not one of my favorites. But okay, <laughs> <laughs> he has his own problems. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, Mark, tell us. Um, you've mentioned a little bit here and there about um playing Poe, you know, in or reciting and yeah, things like that with po. your wife. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, like what um how like how many different plays or what's your favorite one or not plays stories um it's that time of night where i'm getting sleepy right. um, um like what stories poems are your favorites to do we perform um uh a selection so you know and so what we do is we each do a major story so okay. um sarah does uh the mask of the red death okay. and, brilliantly and we do it in costume. We do it in, uh, you know, period costume. Oh, nice. Um, and, we, and we lace um, biographical information about Poe throughout and in between. Okay. So each, we'll, we'll, the one who is not performing set introduces the uh, next one's, the next peep that the other gotcha. one does. But so we each do a long poem. We each do a short poem. And we each do a story. So um, I do um, Annabelle Lee. Nice. Uh, El Dorado. Uh, mm -hmm. the short poem the raven and um the cask of amontillado okay with sarah doing the voice of fortunato and then sarah okay. does the bells and alone um and um the mask of the red death and then we come together at the end on the spirits of the dead oh nice okay so it's, a, it's a nice it's a it's a, it's a nice you know uh it it, it we it, takes about we do it in one act and we can do this in about an hour and 10 minutes okay basically. okay because but the cask of amontillado the black uh the, the cask of amontillado the telltale heart and um the mask of the red death are all five thousand words almost exactly okay mm -hmm. which means you can perform them word for word not leave anything out and do it very concisely and do it in about uh, 12 minutes okay you know, okay. 12, 15 minutes you can mm -hmm. you can do the whole thing, so that's why I say they're perfect monologues. They really are. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, some of the stories uh, take a while to get going, and he builds like the House of Usher takes a while to get going. Oh yes, mm -hmm. you know, yes, the whole thing and description and things like that. And House of Usher is a much longer story. Yeah, absolutely. You know, to perform that in its entirety would take about half of the your 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 time. So okay. <laughs> It is not quite the perfect monologue that the Telltale Heart is, where mm -hmm. the Cask of Amontillado is. Okay, right. Yeah. So, do, are is one of them your your personal favorite, or? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to perform, to perform the, the poem, the poem would be Annabelle Lee. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I just, you know, it, it's it's beautiful. Yes, I, the the Raven is difficult. Um, I am only now getting to the point that I think I do the Raven reasonably well. Okay, it's taken me probably uh, fifteen years. Wow, 
the raven is very difficult there's so many gradations and you know you're just getting everything yeah. exactly right and there's there's nights when you think i've got this section really well but that's you know uh, uh, but yeah the last year or so has been a breakthrough year where you know um i'm no longer scared of performing the raven and i actually look forward to to perform okay, you know, okay. Really, it's been, but annabelle lee has always been you know it's it, it's 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 just a wonderful piece yeah and the language is wonderful and uh i just there's, there's something about that one that just got me and then my favorite story is the cast of the multiata because i i i just think it, it it is so much fun to do oh that. it is it's one of it, my favorites you know we performed that a few years ago and uh one of sarah's best friends was in the audience and uh we when we got through, I got one of the highest best compliments I've ever gotten uh, for a stage because she she took Sarah aside and said, "I'll never completely trust Mark again." Oh. <laughs> That's a good compliment, right and there. And I said, "Thank you, thank you." Oh That's my great. goodness! That's <laughs> you and and it's but it is such a delicious piece. It's it so is wonderful, it's... you know, and and I love the you know the theatricality of it. Yeah. Um, and then getting to play that that whole thing because Montresor is playing the whole time. Oh yeah. yes. And yet there's these moments where you're not sure where he talks about being heartsick and where you know he's overwhelmed mm -hmm. by what he's doing and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just all of these things you get to play in this. Yeah. His his, his contempt for Fortunato. Yeah. Know, where he's you know Poe doesn't put things in quotes, but there's lines in the cask of Amontillado where you can see the where he calls him the noble Fortunato. Yes, you know exactly. <laughs> you see the air quotes hanging yes. there, and you're going, "I saw that." That's, like, that's how oh. good he is, you know, in, in, in what he does. So I mean, yeah. what he gives you to play. So you know, that the cask of Amontillado is but definitely my favorite piece. Yeah, um, it is the more. perfect example of Poe's leaving it to the reader how you feel mm -hmm. because every time i read that it doesn't matter i switch every once in a while one minute i'll be for fortunato and one i'll be like at montessor and then i'm going wait a minute which one should i actually be you know wanting justice for here mm -hmm. and, 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 and fortunato is such a horse's ass and exactly. yet, nobody deserves to be exactly. <laughs> to be walled up, you know. I know. Uh, so it's one of those, it's one of those priceless pieces to where you're going, well, I still want to go back and read it again because maybe I missed something and I should be, you know, wanting to wall him up for good and just be done with it. So oh, I'm yeah. here. It it's one of those stories that it, it it's in my top five of of post stories that I just love and mm -hmm. at the really top tip top. And it's one that I can go back and read. I could probably go back and read that every day. I just, I love that story so mm -hmm. much. And, and, you know, because you, I have to, to pray, because you said, what's your favorite. Now, if you said like, what do you sure. think this is his best? I would say, no, I don't think it's his best. I think yeah. it's, it's my favorite, but uh, you yeah. know, and, 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 and that's because of a very personal connection to it. Right, yes. right. Getting to perform it, um, yeah. but I, I'd, I'd have to argue that I, I, I don't, uh, I don't know what the greatest short story ever written was, but I know that if anybody was assembling a list of ten great short stories, the yeah. Telltale Heart's going to be on it. Yes, yes, that is a perfect model. I mean, it, 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 it's a perfect thing to give somebody to show them how to write a short story. Yes. How to write with all your senses, how to write with, you know, the economy. There's not a wasted word in the telltale heart. Absolutely. You know, and I had to, um, I, I, I didn't have to, I was, I was honored to do a, a, a story for Publishers Weekly where they asked me to pick the 10 best post short stories. And I said, I like best. That's a very subjective term. And everybody yeah. likes mm -hmm. best this 10. I said, it's not a horse race for crowd. I said, I tell you what I will do. I'll put it together. So I'll call it the 10 essential Poe. Oh, nice. Okay. Even confining that to 10 is difficult. Um, yeah. But, you know, I started with the telltale heart. Okay. Know, certainly started there because I, I do think it is, you know, the end of the 10 where, you know, is. It, it, it's murder not to put the black cat on that list, but the black cat and the telltale heart are very similar. They are. Yeah. And if you're going to do one, you know, 
You, mm -hmm. you got to do the telltale heart. And the same thing, yeah. I hate to leave out the murders in the Rue Morgue, but the Purloin letter is the height of his art as far as the Dupin stories go. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, so you make very difficult decisions. And, you know, you got to put in uh, the House of Usher and you have to have uh, yeah. mm -hmm. certainly the pit and the pendulum. Yes. Uh, you know, so, you know, and then, you know, the, the, some stories which I think are a little bit of surprises like Hop Frog, which I think is. You yeah. Know, because there unlike the cask of amontillado you are rooting for the person mm -hmm. who is out for revenge you are totally mm -hmm. on the side yeah. um, and and in, in some ways the payoff in that one is even more grisly and more horrible than the uh, right <laughs> cask of amontillado. so oh. um, so yeah i mean I, that's the wonderful thing about poe is he gives you these you know these wonderful i mean i, I Again, if I was going to put one mystery story on the list, it would be um, it would be the Purloin letter. Yeah, but that, you know, but in his lifetime, the Gold Bug was the most successful of his, you know, of his stories of mystery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was going to say I I enjoyed the Gold Bug as well, and I like the um, cryptology aspect of it too. Um, it just it's fun going in and looking at all that part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing about Poe, too, is, you know, everybody think, you know, this guy was spent all his time in cemeteries and, you know, hanging right. around graves and all things like this. And Poe had an amazingly acquisitive mind. You know, you talk about curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, Poe was interested in everything. Yeah. I mean, Vincent Price once said, and he wasn't talking about Edgar Allan Poe. He was just making a point, but he might as well have been talking about Poe when Vincent Price said that the person who limits his interests limits his life. Yeah. That's exactly. a great quote. It's a wonderful quote. And yeah. um, and, and, and Poe was, I mean, Poe is interested in, in in geography and languages and rocks and flowers and uh mm -hmm. expeditions, and you know, he every he was just interested in everything that was out there. You know, I mean, so, he wrote a story about what seashells, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. it was a textbook. One yeah. The, one the, he, he, yeah. Yeah. Well, he wrote it. I mean, he was actually yeah. you know, uh, re yeah. kind of doing a, a rewriting. It was his most successful book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and who would think that seashells would be a successful book that you would attach to Poe when you're going? Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. Like monster seashells, you know, were they like. You know, it, it's one of those murder? things where. I, when, when I tell audiences about, you know, the Poe who, who the real Poe, and again, I say, you know, that in his lifetime, Poe was not best known as an author of short stories or as a poet, but as you know, he was best known as a literary critic and a very Absolutely. good one. Mm -hmm. He's an excellent critic. Yeah. The people that Poe praised deserve to be praised and deserved. I mean, he was praising people like Nathaniel Hawthorne and yeah. you know, Irving. And, you know, and, and the, the, the stuff he panned was largely stuff that had been forgotten and deserved to be forgotten. And uh, he was a very good critic. And and the person who most recognized that was George Bernard Shaw later on, because Shaw was also mm -hmm. a critic as well as being a playwright. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shaw basically said, you know, that, that Poe was the greatest journalistic critic of all time. And mm -hmm. uh, he should be it's like um, somebody. I can't remember who said it, but somebody in the book said that everybody wants to claim Poe. Uh, the mystery yeah. writers want him. The horror writers want him. The science fiction writers want him. The one group that that doesn't make a big deal about Pope should are critics because he yeah. really was a terrific uh, and a very astute critic. Yeah. And, um, but that's what he and you know so we his time knew him first as a critic, second as a poet, third as a short story writer. Our time has reversed that order. We know yeah. him first for the the short story, second as a as the poet, and third mm -hmm. if you know it at all as yeah. a critic. That as we were talking about before just begins to define how much he wrote, you know, his, his literature. Absolutely. Just, Absolutely. Just, just at that point. Well, and, and I think a, in a lot of the collections that are out there, I have a couple collections and not in even like my big collection doesn't even have everything. Absolutely not. But it has a few criticisms and it's at the very end um, I have not, I've kind of glanced over them, but we focus all, so much on the short stories and poetry. Um, I've told myself I've got to sit down and read some of these and find more out there. But I wish someone would put a book together of his criticisms. I think that would be 
a really interesting read and help people understand how diverse Poe was. I'd like to see uh, actually a, a now a, a modern uh, official complete works. You know, oh, that would be yes. amazing. You know, because I, I really do, th- you know, and it probably, you know, some somebody like the University of Virginia would probably have to tackle it. You know, yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, but I would really like because again, you know, our our collected Poe uh, editions are 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 pretty out of date. Mm-hmm. And, and nobody has really tackled the, you know, sort of the the, the full the full Monty that yeah. deserves to be done for, for Poe. And, uh, you yeah. know, it, it's not like Twain where um, uh, uh, to, comp- to to do a complete works of Twain is going to be the work of several lifetimes. We would never live to see it done, but right. with Poe, we, we, you know, it could be done because he mm-hmm. only lived to be 40 and he, there is a lot of writing there. Yeah, but it's not like Twain, where you you have you know, and with Twain, we're still discovering new stuff. You know, mm-hmm. yes, we're still discovering new letters uh, every year. We 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 discover letters we never knew existed. So okay, you know, so but but Poe, I, yeah, I, I I would like to see you know, but um, but I'm also you know I'm I'm a, you know there were two more books on Poe were just published this year after mine, and I'm delighted by that. I just mm-hmm. think you know that you keep seeing this interest in Poe yes absolutely yeah it it, it's amazing Jeannie what other questions did you have for Mark no he's answered everything I was curious about yeah I say that once again thank you for sharing your book with us that it was very much a nice it did have its academic quality I will say that because of the research that you embedded into it but I you know I like the academia as much as I do the other things. And it did tell a story of two timelines converging. And a lot of people miss that, that technically we have so many unanswered questions about Poe that we can only implement what we do know and how we can find those answers from a forensics point of view. Because we don't have the strict... Like we don't, like you were saying, we don't have the tissue we can dig up and do a full DNA analysis to find out how he truly died. And it is ironic that him being the father of the detective story, him leaving us the perfect cold case of how he truly died and and all that. So, you know, and you do go back, I guess I was saying before, how you always, with Poe, you start at the end. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it, in one way, it's not surprising because, you know, the, Poe has the greatest literary stage exit of all time. Mm-hmm. Yes. This is the best exit. I mean, there are three great literary stage exits in history. The first is Moliere. Yes. Now, Moliere was a, was a playwright as well as an actor, you know. Mm-hmm. And Moliere was dying of consumption. Yes. And they were premiering his last play. And he's in the play. So yeah. he's dying. And he's, 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 he's trying to get through his, the, 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 this performance uh, uh, this, uh, of, his, of his last play. He collapses on stage. They drag mm-hmm. him into the wings. They revive him and they push him back out. He goes out and he finishes the play. And then he goes home and he dies. You know, that is pretty darn good for a, a writer yeah. who is both a playwright and an actor. That Absolutely. is a good yeah, one. And then there's Twain, you know, yes. because Mark Twain, who was born uh, November 30th, 1835, with Halley's Comet, mm-hmm. at the point where it's closest to the earth in the night sky. Yeah. And a year before his death in, uh, in 1910, he correctly predicts that he will die when the comet comes back. Yes. And he does. He pulls it off. This is one mm-hmm. of the great. He in, in 1909 he tells an audience uh, about him referring to himself and Halley's comet. The Almighty mm-hmm. has said, no doubt, that here are these two indefinable freaks. They yes. came in together. They must go out together. Right? Mm-hmm. I'm looking exactly. forward to that. And this is like Babe Ruth, you know, predicting the home run. Right. This yeah. is, you know, <laughs> he pulls this <laughs> off. You know, and, and imagine that. I mean, you know, I mean, a, a hero being born and dying with a comet in the sky. That's something which would not have been out of place in Greek mythology. That Absolutely. Is, yeah. Yeah. 
But in some way, Poe outdoes them all because he dies under circumstances which reflect his two greatest literary achievements. Mm -hmm. Poe actually dies under circumstances which would not be out of place in one of his own horror stories. Yeah. He dies lingering. He dies in pain. He dies Mm -hmm. ranting. So, you know, that that could be right out of one of his own horror stories. Yes. And then he dies in a manner that he leaves us not only with a mystery, but a double-barreled mystery, because he not only leaves us with the mystery of what he died of, but then there are the missing days. And nobody has ever solved, gotten anywhere near solved that either, because there nobody ever stepped forward to say, you know, I passed him on the street. I had a conversation with him on the steamer coming from Richmond. Nothing, Mm -hmm. nothing there. That is a complete curtain which has descended over those missing days, yeah. which we are not allowed to see. So mm-hmm. Poe leaves us with not one mystery, but two mysteries. The father of the detective story dies under circumstances which reflect his two greatest literary achievements. And that's almost like a press agent stepped in at some point and said, Eddie, yes. you know what the <laughs> best thing for your career would be? Die at 40, <laughs> die under circumstances. Which are going to be the, the two things you're remembered for. Yeah. You know? you That's see. better. That's yeah. even better. So, yeah. It's like his own press agent was standing off in the wings going, okay, you, this is what you got to do. And so I'm yes. going to it. The only thing that I could say that would probably make the perfect trifecta for his death is if they had found him walled up somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you didn't know how he got there. And you'd be like... Well, okay. you know, you know, Moran tries that almost because Moran at some point, because uh, his his descriptions of Poe's death become increasingly more Victorian melodramatic. And yes. uh, at one point he, he, he says, he writes something like, you know, was Poe imagining a, 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 a bird, a raven that he could... Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just a little much there. Not just reaching, but overreaching. You yeah. Know. Oh, I know. Oh my and goodness. Then, Moran puts words into Poe's mouth that Poe would have been ashamed to have had attributed to him. You know, yes. he'd be like, yeah. Stop trying to be my writer. I'm my own writer. I don't mm-hmm. need to bring my words. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, but again, that's that's one of the, the things about Poe is that all the people around him at the end are just, they're, they're completely unreliable. Yeah. In, in yeah. Testimony. So, just Even, like his unreliable narrators and all, yeah. of, you know, so many. And of it fits stories. his characterization so much. It's not even funny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's so Pope fascinates, but he's going to continue to fascinate. Yes. Yes. So yes. He's going to continue to do. He's not only going to continue to thrill us. He's not only going to continue to fire up our imaginations. He's not only going to feed our curiosity. He is also going to continue to haunt us because yes. we we're, 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 you know, there are aspects of Poe which will never be solved. Thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I welcome his haunting. I do. Yes. Yes. Me too. <laughs> Just like Dolly was haunted. Exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Well, Mark, what other projects have you got coming up? Well, I, I'm I'm right now uh, reworking a book that I had published in '97. If you remember, it's a series called The Night Stalker with Darren yes. McGavin. The, uh, mm-hmm. I, I it. actually mm-hmm. just listened to um, on Audible um, the collected stories. Um, that they, they were fantastic. Okay. Um, well, uh, I, I did a, a lot on on that character back then. I did two book nonfiction books and a novel. Uh, based on that guy I did the first original novel with Cole Shack at 20 years that was published okay. called Grave Secrets mm-hmm. which was published in 94 so um I that book has been out of print for a while and uh, the, so I'm, I'm working on revising that right now uh and so that's probably going to come out next year uh okay. an expanded revised copy of that mm-hmm. and then um as far as what the next book will be I could tell you but I'll probably be wrong Okay. <laughs> because I've never been right yet. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding about that. I mean, my first book was published in 1982 when I was still living in that Tri-Cities area, Upper East Tennessee, mm-hmm. Southwest yeah. Virginia. And um, if you had said to me at that point, what's your next book? It's people did. They said, you know, what's your next book? It's a very flattering question because it, you know, it presupposes there will be another book, you know. So mm-hmm. 
if you had asked me then, what is your next book? I would have said, I know what the next book is going to be because I've already started working on it. I'm going to write the history of the Twilight Zone. You know, why not me? It's my favorite show of all time. You yes. know, never thinking to myself, maybe Upper East Tennessee isn't the best place to be writing a book on the Twilight Zone. Maybe that's not <laughs> the, the optimum headquarters for this. But, you know, I had written, my first book was a history of the Barter Theater in Abingdon, Virginia, which is this amazing theater, uh, which was started in the depths of the Depression. Yeah. Yep. I performed yeah. there. I performed as Mark Twain yeah. at the Barter. Oh, nice. And, um, uh, so um, that book was published in 82, and two of the people who were at the, got their start at the barter had been in episodes of The Twilight Zone. Claude Aikens and Fritz Weaver both had been in. Yes, in, yes, yes, yes. And then, you know, one day uh, when I was working in Tennessee, Donna Douglas came to town, dressed as Ellie Mae Clampett from the Beverly Hillbilly. She was doing a commercial for like RVs or something. And I ran down to the production site, and she'd been in a famous Twilight Zone episode called Eye of the Beholder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I interviewed her. So I was doing enough to fool myself that this was going to be my next book. You know? Okay. And then in 1982, I walked into a bookstore and there it was. Mark Scott Secree's The Twilight Zone Companion. He he wrote the book and published the book that I was thinking about writing. And I couldn't even get angry about it because he did a great job. It's a fabulous book. It still is yeah. a fabulous book. So I immediately set my sights on another favorite series, which was Columbo. And I spent the next few years researching and writing that book. That was published in 1989 as the okay. Columbo file. Nice. And then if you had said to me then, what's your next book going to be? I said, I know what my next book is going to be because I have a handshake deal with this publisher who did the Columbo file. It's going to be on Dashiell Hammett, the mystery writer and the author mm -hmm. of the Maltese Falcon. And yeah. I've got this great idea. They love the idea. I love the idea. We've agreed to it. We hadn't gotten to the contract phase. And then the company that owned that publisher, the Mysterious Press, Warner Books, stepped in and stripped away their nonfiction line and said, you're now strictly a fiction. So, and it was at that point, a, pu a small publisher called me and said, I love your Columbo book. Have you ever thought about doing the same type of book on the Night Stalker? And I said, well, I love the Night Stalker. I'm a reporter mm -hmm. today because of Carl Kolshak. Yeah. Um, I said, but I didn't know there was a publisher crazy enough to do that book. He said, well, I'm crazy enough to do that book. So now I did that book. That book led to writing the first novel, the uh, Kolshak novel, that led to um, doing books on Dracula and things like that. And mm -hmm. what I was doing was I was working my way back to the Twilight Zone and didn't okay. see it. Never saw it, you know, but I was now getting enough sort of credits on the horror, uh, you know, to sort of side of the street. Yeah. That when I started sharing the Twilight Zone with my daughter, when she turned 15, we did a fall, force march through all 156 episodes. And mm -hmm. I kept saying to her after each episode is kind of a joke, you know, you let that be a lesson to you, you know, and, <laughs> it was a joke. and after a few times of this, I finally realized it wasn't a joke that the Twilight Zone really were morality tales. They were parable. Yeah. They were all, you know, uh, life lessons. And I thought this is your this is your Twilight Zone book, stupid. It took 35 years to get it. But you're this is your Twilight Zone book. So. Yeah. You know, at, we all like to think we are in control of our lives. We all like to think we are masters of our of our fate. We are captains of our ship. We are making the command decisions. But when you step back and you look at the pattern of your life, you realized you were pushed into certain places where you were meant to be at different times. Mm -hmm. And you see how dominoes fell. Yeah. And, and they fell in a certain direction. And uh, so every time I said, you know, somebody asked me that question, what's your next book going to be? I was wrong, you know, and, and, and I was, I, and I would not have said Edgar Allan Poe after the Twilight Zone book. I wouldn't have yeah. said, Poe. I would have said, it was a matter of fact, I was working on a book on Stephen King at the time. Okay. And, uh, as a matter, and, and part of that book became a book I did on the Shawshank Redemption. I did a book on the, the, wow. the film of the Shawshank Redemption, the making oh, of nice. it. Okay. And, um, I, I went through that whole, you know, thing of like, well, it's, it's going to be about Stephen King. I got this great idea. And I, you know, and that book never got done. But a publisher, an editor said Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. So I never saw that one coming. So, you know, the, the quickest way to make sure that this next idea is to tell you what I'm thinking the next book is going to be, because it's not <laughs> going to be. <laughs> I know enough. I know enough to, to say, you know, trust you know, you go where the currents take you. Yeah. And you cannot predict where that might be. Just go with it. 
and understand that you know there, there is going to be a, a, a next book but you know i'm not foolish enough to predict it anymore yeah so in essence it's just follow you and you have no idea where it may come to so i you know I, i've got I'm, I'm talking to my agent about two or three different ideas there's one that she particularly likes mm -hmm. as soon as she said that's the one she really likes i said and that's why it's not going to happen <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Because you think it's a great idea, you know, and, and I, yeah. I think, like, you know, look, you know, we didn't, I didn't think of this Edgar Allan Poe book and you didn't think of this Edgar Allan Poe it was an editor at St. Martin's who saw something in me to say, you should be the person to do this. Yeah. yeah. That, I said, remember, this isn't that, you know, we didn't think of this one, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I say sometimes it takes somebody else to point out the obvious. Yeah. Know? Right. That's and true. That was true of, of, of this conversation with with this editor. You know, he saw it, he saw it correctly. You know, and then when I decided to do it, you know, it scared the hell out of me. You yeah, know? And, and that's a good thing. You know, John Steinbeck once said that a good writer writes scared. Yeah, and what he meant was you should tackle things which are challenging enough that it scares you a little bit. Because if yeah. you're not scared a little bit, you're doing something that's safe. Yeah, you're doing something that's in your comfort zone, and you're not pushing yourself. Mm -hmm. So you should be a little scared by what you do. And certainly, with with, with Poe, when you set out to write a biography of, of, of a subject as big as Edgar Allan Poe, mm -hmm. that's like going after the great white whale. That's yeah, yes. You you have to be a little crazy to do that. You know, <laughs> yeah. it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but you know, he was wonderful company. You know, he still is. Yeah, really, absolutely. You know, it's like, like I said, you know, dinner with Mark Twain, but I would love to have been Poe's friend. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's he a, would that's definitely a... have made it interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, definitely. I would want you cussing him half the time, but he would have made it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, do you have anything else you would like to add for our listeners? You know, um, I'm sure there's something. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come to you eventually, right? That's the way yeah. it is for me. Yeah, because you know, it, it has been great talking with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I, the only thing I would add is that, you know, um, if there is some something of a common theme in what I write, it is about writing. It is about my love of writing and writers. And mm -hmm. an awful lot of what I've done is sort of, you know, behind the Twilight Zone book is Rod Serling, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there have been books on Mark Twain, you know, behind the Shawshank book is Stephen King. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here's Poe, you know, coming along. Um, there is an ongoing fascination and celebration of of the written word in, in, in what I do. So, um, you know, and with Poe, I, I guess I just never stop celebrating. Because yeah. the language is so wonderful and the stories are so terrific that um, that's why he's going to go on. That's yeah. why, again, you know, he's he, he's he's he is he is always he's always got something to tell us. Yeah, and a lot of what he tells us is about ourselves. Mm -hmm. and and that's things we don't want to hear. Very much so. Very much so. I mean, you know, the mask of the Red Death. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the, if there is a greater indictment of human vanity and pride, I don't know what it is. Absolutely. It, you know, and uh, and boy, did that story take on more resonance during the pandemic? Absolutely. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, Poe was writing at a time when the plagues were much more recent, touchable thing. You know. Mm -hmm. So, um, he was also living at a time when communicable diseases were all around, and particularly tuberculosis. You know, absolutely. You know, I mean, his mother dies of tuberculosis. His father dies of tuberculosis. His brother dies of tuberculosis. His wife dies of tuberculosis. Yeah. His mm -hmm. stepmother dies of his foster mother dies of tuberculosis. Yeah, too, way too close to home for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, almost everybody probably uh, a staggering percentage of the population. Was contaminated with tuberculosis. Was, was walking yes. around with tuberculosis, whether it was active or not. It yeah. was probably yes. in your system. There was probably no escaping it. Yeah, from, you know, it's just Absolutely. a matter of would it go active and when would it go active. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, being a teacher, 
um, even today, the one test you do still have to take to, as part of, you know, doing all of your interviewing, processing, fingerprinting, all of those things is a TB test, which mm -hmm. I think is very interesting that you don't get tested for other things, but that is the one that you do get tested for. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it just, I find that fascinating. Yep. Well, well, it is a disease that's still around. I mean, right. My yeah. cousin who owned goats, if you have goats, you have to have a TB test because goats transfer and have TB still. You can still find that disease in goats. I, I knew somebody who um, whose who's elderly father, he was in his early 80s and he went for, uh, uh, she took him for a medical checkup mm -hmm. and they gave him a really thorough medical. And the doctor said to him, how long have you had tuberculosis? Mm -hmm. And the guy said, I don't have tuberculosis. He said, your lungs say otherwise. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and, you know, so, I mean, it is possible, you know, for the, that to be there. And it's, again, it's just not be effective. You'd be strong right. enough. You know, it heals over. Yeah. And you're carrying those nodules around in your lungs. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yes, it, it, it is. It's a disease which has been around and has been documented in, in ancient, ancient remains. Mm -hmm. yep. it's one that still is, is, is around it's very it's a very persistent little bug yeah yeah oh my goodness well on that note <laughs> <laughs> mark yeah, thank you end. yeah thank you so much for being with well, us tonight you. it was awesome talking with you and um talking about your book and all the other po things and um we um, cannot wait for you to be on our PO Unplugged with us. Um, we have a really awesome group that joins us and mm -hmm. everybody, you know, will have read the cask of Amontillado and we'll talk about it and um, can't wait to hear some of your thoughts on it, you know, mixed in with our group. It'll be great. Hey, you heard a little bit of it tonight. So you got yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a sneak yeah. preview. Absolutely. Because. Yeah. So I, I'm sure several of them will probably listen to this by the time mm -hmm. we do that. So, well, you know, and, and in that case, you know, um, obviously, you know, you've already discovered I like to talk. Um, right, you're <laughs> that's talking. okay. That's okay. Well, we we, but, we and, like and, when you talk. <laughs> but, but and I'll be glad to that, that night as well. But I'm going to be more interested in listening and hearing what people mm -hmm. have to say. You know, so I'll be yeah. glad to contribute in any way. But you know, I already know what I think about the Casco of Montiato. So yes, <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to share. Trust me. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. And they'll they'll probably want to hear what your take on it too. So. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's interesting because it's one of his last great short stories, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he's got that golden period from around 1838 yeah. to 1845, which is when most of the, you know, really terrific poems, short stories, everything. And then there's, there's that last blossoming of poetry, that return, yeah. that triumphant return to poetry at the end. Yeah. Um, you, you kind of, you know, the, the be very beginning is poetry and the very end yeah. is poetry. Yeah, and, then, and he's got that almost like a dying patient to having that that rush of health at yeah. the end, mm -hmm. and you know in that period you get the bells, and oh, you, get yeah, the so Lady, good. you get El Dorado, and you get all of these wonderful poems at the end. Um, yes. So you know the Ravens kind of signals the return to poetry. It's 1845. It's, it's yeah. a very creative period. Mm -hmm. But the cast of Amontillado is in that same time period. And mm -hmm. he, he doesn't write many short stories after that. He's yeah, little, he really little, doesn't. Little. Yeah. Hot Frog is one of the few. Yeah, Hot that's Frog true. Is actually one of the very few short stories that he writes towards the end. Yeah. Uh, and that is an endlessly fascinating story. Yeah. And he he really considered himself a poet. And I think to me, that's kind of with the Raven and him considering it as big as it was, I think he really wanted to go back to being a true poet. It Not seemed just like. a poet, but a romantic poet. Yes, yes. You know, his hero is Lord Byron. Yes. And, you know, he emulates Byron dressing in black and, you know, yeah. sort of puffing up his resume to be a little bit more adventuresome than he was. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, <laughs> he, you know he, Byron is definitely the role model. 
And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I and I think it was Ed Pettit at the, the Rosenbach in Philadelphia, a wonderful post scholar. Um, I think it was Ed who said, and it's in the book, um, he didn't get to be Lord Byron. He got to be some. He got to be something better. He got to be Edgar Allan Poe. And yeah. how much better is that than being Lord? Who reads Lord Byron today? Yeah, that's true. Oh, the one piece Lord Byron wrote. He got to be Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, I remember reading that in your book, and I was like, "That is beautiful. That just that's awesome." Yep, that is. Yeah, awesome. that's one of the things about the the not to prolong the conversation, but that that yeah, that's okay. one of the things that I was very tickled about in the book was when I went to all of these post scholars, mm -hmm. and academics, and museum curators. One of the things I encouraged them all to do was don't talk like you're talking to another academic. Mm -hmm. Remember, you're talking. Uh, ultimately, you're going to be talking to people. Yeah, you're not going to be. So don't talk like you 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 you're, you're writing for each other. Or you're talking to each other. Mm -hmm. A very boring conversation. Say this the way you would say anything. Say yeah. this the way you would say. And they, I, I think that there was a very liberating thing for them because they've never they, they, they allowed them to talk about Poe in a very mm -hmm. personal way. Yeah. And it also gave me because they would say something like that, like Ed said about that, you know. And as soon as he said, I thought it's gold. It's going right in the book. As soon as they yeah, said that, you know, that is gold, and that's it going. Is. I know that's going in the book. It's like at one point, um, it was Ed again. I, I, I you know, the Poe's. There's something of a rivalry among the major cities associated with Poe as to who has the best claim on Poe. Mm -hmm. You know, Baltimore is obviously done the best because the whole city mm -hmm. has embraced Poe in a way that most cities don't embrace literary people, even the football yeah. team named for, I don't, I can't think of another uh, sports team of any kind that is named either for a, a literary character or a, or a literary reference. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that, that alone, you know, and, you know, Baltimore likes to say within this competition, they like to say, we have the body, we win. Um, yeah. But, you know, but in the house, in one of the houses, because, yeah. And they, have, and they have one of the few surviving houses where Poe yeah. lived, that yeah. tiny little row house. Um, but, and Poe didn't live in Baltimore that long. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he's there in the early 1830s, and the Poe family is originally from Baltimore, and he dies there. Yeah. You know, um, so, but, but, but Richmond is probably the city of his heart. Uh, yeah. but, but the museum mm -hmm. there has no direct connection to Poe. It's it's a mm -hmm. wonderful museum, but it is. Yeah. But he does. He grows up in Richmond. If it, it's it sort of <laughs> shapes. So Richmond has a very strong claim on Poe. Mm -hmm. Baltimore has a strong claim on Poe. He's born in Boston and he really lives in New York. I mean, you know, for the last five years and, he, mm -hmm. and that's where he's living when he dies, you know. So but oh, the yeah. city that gets lost in all this is Philadelphia. Yes. Because he's in Philadelphia from 1838 to 1844. He's there for, for six or seven years. And these are the golden years. Yeah. These are the years when he writes almost all of the great short stories that he's known for. Mm -hmm. So I asked Ed Pettit, I said, you know, put it, you know, how would you make the argument for Philadelphia? You know, which always gets lost in, in the Poe conversation. Yeah. And Ed said... Look, when you go into the Baseball Hall of Fame, you go in under the uniform for the team with for whom you put up your big numbers. Poe put up his big numbers here in Philadelphia. And I thought, what a great way to say it. What that is. Good, and I thought, that's going right in the book. That is yes. first <laughs> word going right in the book. You know, it, and it's a wonderful way to make an argument as to why Philadelphia has this claim on Poe. You know, yeah. like Philadelphia even has one of the few houses associated with Poe, one of the five oh, yeah. that he lived in Philadelphia is still standing. Yeah. So, but he, that's the kind of thing I encourage them to do. And they all, and, and all, and they all came through. They all came through with, with, with just wonderful things like that. Mm -hmm. they give you an insight to Poe that you can't get by sort of very strict scholarly analysis. You mm -hmm. know? Right. It's playing it for real. This is why, yeah. why is, but why is Philadelphia important? He put up his big numbers here. That's why. Yes. Oh yeah. And he hit I, his I, ones here, you know? <laughs> yeah. And when you go into the basement of that Philadelphia house, black you can cat comes feel alive. The black cat. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like, we, where is he? <laughs> he's not, you know, it's, it's, you know, we know he wrote the black cat while he was there and you do yeah. see a shirt and really feel it, you know? You so, do. I mean, you've you got do. the house and the, the cottage in, 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 in Fordham. Mm-hmm. You've got the house in Philadelphia and the house in Baltimore, the museum in Richmond and yeah. the room at the, the, uh, now what boston has is the best statue yes it is amazing boston has a, you know the, the 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 statue in richmond is kind of stayed and then and yeah. then the statue in, in baltimore is better the statue in baltimore is better than the statue in but boston's yeah. got that amazing yeah and you can walk product. right up to it i i've gotten my picture made there multiple but, times and yeah boston is sort of made up for lost time with that statue so yeah, I, yeah. I, you got to give them full credit for that yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, all right. Well, again, Mark, the, I, I'm just in awe. It's it's been amazing talking to you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, this is you know uh, a subject near and dear to my heart. You know, yes, so, yeah. or my telltale heart, if you will. Absolutely, so, you know, absolutely. You know, yeah. the, the opportunity to talk about Poe is just you know I'll, I'll grab it, and obviously, I'm not going to be shy about it. Yeah. Oh, no. And we, we are glad you were not shy. And I mean, we could probably sit here and talk all, several hours longer because we both love Poe. And, uh, you know, the, my Poe back here is always on the wall with my uh, Poe Museum Black Cat calendar. <laughs> so I, I noticed that. I didn't know. Yeah. That. Yeah. J- just got the new one <laughs> for next year. But um, yes, so again, thank you. And we really look forward to you being with us for Poe Unplugged on December 19th. We'll have a good time. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And so, Jeannie, are you ready? I'm ready. We are. Are Poe Out. Out.